so, so this presentation will be um, about one of the approaches, how we do recommendations in, uh, in uh, Crito. And um, uh, specifically, like, to give a, a, cup, a little bit of background, right? Like, uh, Critel business is mostly personalized advertising, which means, like, personalized recommendations for sure play an important role in all, in all of that. And, uh, uh, like, w w one of the uh, uh, tweaks of Crito is that we do that at a huge scale. So we have a lot of users and we have to recommend a lot of products. Basically, we, we have an order of billion products uh, worldwide. And uh, we always want to know not just like what are the best recommendations to show for users, but uh, uh, some uh, general properties of products. So uh, w which products are more similar to each other, like a fridge and a shower or a fridge and a washing machine? Uh, can we establish some kind of metric uh, for, these, uh, for, for these entities? And uh, if we have this, can we map it to users so that we can have some kind of metric between users? Which users are more similar to each other? Uh, like those that uh, buy PS4 and, uh, or those that buy, uh, uh, and, and those that buy a baseball bat, for instance, or those that buy uh, some uh, home appliances. Which of them are more similar or what does it, this similarity mean? And uh, after we establish some form of that, uh, basically, one of the questions that we have to answer like every day uh, for billions of requests is, for instance, we have a user that visited, uh, Yves, uh, like visited Verbaudet, which is a small um, like uh, kids uh, stuff uh, boutique. What would we recommend to them from eBay, which they never visited before? This is a very uncommon situation for recommender system uh, in the literature. It's uh, not frequently studied, but that's what we deal with every day. So uh, one of the standard approaches to, uh, to this kind of uh, problems in general uh, is an implicit feedback approach, where basically we take the user timelines and data, the, uh, basically the, the products they viewed from uh, uh, all uh, vocabulary of, uh, of products, and we transform them into, um, uh, into a matrix uh, defined by uh, users and, uh, and items on the base of uh, views that the user did, the sales or our clicks that they did, right? So we end up with this kind of matrix that you probably all familiar with. And then uh, based on this kind of uh, transformation that we can uh, do a lot of stuff and there are a plethora of methods uh, like uh, varying from simple SVD of this matrix towards more, um, more complicated uh, factorizations of this matrix towards more uh, novel stuff like uh, variational order quarters, collaborative filtering. And uh, they vary in quality and they vary in scalability. But as a matter of fact, uh, there is very little literature that deals with the uh, uh, size of problems that we have. There are a couple of uh, papers that they, they, uh, they do with this kind of data, but most of the uh, research is done as way smaller data set with way smaller vocabularies and number of users as well. So uh, they, uh, basically the uh, approaches are either uh, very good for these small data sets or they, try, uh, they uh, require a really uh, non-trivial amount of engineering. Uh, so they cannot be put in the framework of uh, MapReduce or uh, even a wider framework of Spark. And uh, we would really want that. And basically uh, my talk will be uh, about uh, how we uh, a work to improve uh, how we work to solve this problem in Crito, and mostly I will be concerned with the scalability. So, how do we make it scale to like basically one billion products, um, and uh, how do we have data uh, given our like specific problem when we have to do like cross partner recommendations uh, or like cold start recommendations? Uh, basically, the uh, scalability approach is based on the uh, SVD of uh, um, pointwise mutual information matrix. So, uh, what it, so first we construct the a, a user item matrix of counts, and we uh, and basically we construct out of it a product to product uh, co-occurrence matrix. Basically, uh, that will count how often in user timelines two products uh, appear together in the same timeline. And then we uh, do some kind of, uh, uh, we try to remove the popularity of products so that we end up only with similarities of products in this uh, capture through this matrix, which is done 
uh, usually with the uh, uh, with the pointwise virtual information. Um, and and then basically we decomp we decompose this matrix and we extract top singular vectors, which we'll later use uh, to uh, the rows of this matrix will become the embeddings of our products. And then we go on to compose a user embedding uh, as a linear combination of those products. And uh, in this talk, I will not go uh, much further into how we do this linear combination, but I will talk about how we uh, scale the previous steps, basically. How do, the, how do we make them work for like billions of products? And this approach uh, is uh, fairly simple. Uh, there is no, uh, um, yeah, there's not a lot of uh, like, stuff going on basically but we have to do SVD of a very large matrix but uh, it performs uh, fairly well so on most uh, data set that we tested it it performs uh, uh, on par with the weighted uh, factorization methods uh, which are considered standard uh, classical approach but our approach is way way more scalable so uh, yeah, there's some uh, reference, so this is like not uh, new. We base our work on uh, the uh, the previous uh, on the previous research. So uh, now down to the uh, scalable truncated SVD, right? Because uh, uh, you might imagine that just building a matrix can be fairly simple in MapReduce framework, but how do we do the uh, the SVD? So uh, there are three general approaches to do that. The first one maybe mostly in the mostly node is based on uh, some kind of stochastic gradient uh, descent approach for example implemented in Jira. so the problem for this approach is that uh, our matrix is a, is very very sparse that we end up with this uh, uh, if we have like 1 billion products so they occur not, not all of them together of course and uh, mostly uh, the matrix consists in zeros so the problem with SGD approach is that it has to, in some form, uh, take into account the zeros. So either do some kind of negative sampling or uh, have the zeros in the basically train on them. And then the problem becomes that the uh, um, the complexity of the network uh, of the uh, communication of this approach will be uh, n, n squared. So which is prohibitive if you have one billion products. And uh, another approach is. Uh, uh, which is implemented in Spark and Lib is uh, partially distributed. So what happens is you have distributed your uh, matrix and you do uh, 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 you multiply a vector by this matrix. So uh, and you do uh, computations of latent vectors on the driver. The problem is with the driver because you in the memory required uh, there will be linear in the uh, uh, in the number uh, of products that you have which is obviously uh, not possible for uh, 1 billion products. And then there's a third approach that actually works uh, for very large, uh, well, almost arbitrarily large matrices. Uh, it's um, like, uh, it can be found in, the, in Dusk, it's randomized SVD. So uh, it requires uh, uh, the uh, uh, space at the driver only um, quadratic in uh, a number of latent factors that we're trying to find. And its network is linear uh, or almost linear, basically it depends on how many non-zero entries you have in the matrix. But for very sparse matrices, it usually assumed to be linear in the uh, number of products. And it works really well. The problem with the Dusk was that it couldn't actually scale to our, uh, to our particular data set. So the approach was correct, but the implementation did not, uh, did not work for us. So we uh, basically implemented the randomized SVD on our own in Spark. So uh, to give you basically a highlight of uh, uh, what, what's going on in this approach, like how does randomized SVD work, is uh, uh, first step, we have to find a uh, tall and skinny projection uh, that captures most of, the, uh, uh, most of the norm of the matrix that we're trying to decompose, right? Uh, we'll, call this, uh, uh, we'll call this projection Q. So if we, let's assume for a moment that we have this kind of projection that captures most of the norm, and it's low rank, so it's on the rank that we, uh, that we need, basically, like, like 100 uh, latent factors, for instance. Uh, then, then I claim that we can recover uh, the uh, original eigen uh, singular vectors uh, fairly easily. So uh, first, let's observe that. Uh, let's uh, decompose uh, Q transpose uh, A. Uh, basically, assume that we do SVD on it. And uh, it will decompose in uh, U hat S V transpose, where S and V transpose are the original uh, singular values and uh, right singular vectors of A. Uh, so by uniqueness of U, 
um, we can see that if we uh, if we multiply uh, u hat by a q from the left, that we recover the original uh, the original u. And uh, actually, finding u hat is very cheap because uh, we do a q transpose a. Uh, then we take the uh, we, we do the qr decomposition of this matrix, and we do SVD of the uh, upper triangular matrix that we ended up with. And basically, uh, we can show that this uh, uh, right single vectors of this uh, upper triangular matrix are exactly the U hat that we were looking for. And uh, this uh, R, uh, this upper triangular matrix, is just a K by K matrix. So it's very, very cheap. And that's why we require a K, uh, a quadratic K uh, space at our driver. And then we just uh, multiply back and we get our original U that we were looking for. And we were looking for, for exactly the left, uh, the left singular vectors uh, of, uh, of A. And uh, uh, basically to give you, uh, to give you uh, the full algorithm, to how, so how it works, first we generate a random matrix from, uh, like from independent element-wise Gaussian distribution, right? And it is just, it, it's fairly simple, of course. And we uh, multiply uh, A by E, multiple times so we do power iterations and we like orthogonalize after every iteration of course as usual like it's nothing uh, and then we follow uh the uh the structure that i described before so we uh, after the power iteration we got a good orthogonal uh projection uh, q and then we can uh, recover the original u uh, by multiplying by then doing a svd of a smaller matrix and then we return the u that we were looking for so uh, the thing is, this algorithm has a very sharp, very, uh, very nice, uh, very nice uh, um, upper bound on error. So even for a matrix of our size, where n is an order of billion, and we are looking to recover uh, 100 latent factors, if we take just uh, uh, 30 additional latent uh, uh, latent factors, so that our matrix uh, uh, of latent factors is 130, for instance, and we do just three power iterations, we already can recover almost as good approximation of uh, left singular vectors as we would have gotten them with the uh, uh, with the full scale uh, f uh, with the like uh, full SVD SVD of the full matrix. So it, it has very good quality. Uh, and uh, basically the implementation in Spark. Uh, so the uh, basically we need uh, four types of operations to be distributed. First we have to do, uh, we have to generate the uh, uh, distributed uh, matrix G. Then we have to be able to multiply dense uh, uh, B, which is a like a prototype of uh, latent uh, latent factors, by a single block uh, C, which is fairly simple. We can just broadcast it at every uh, partition. And then uh, two tricky operations is QR decomposition of dense B and uh, um, multiplication of sparse A by a dense B. So these are the, the operations that I will describe you how we do it uh, efficiently. So first of all, the uh, uh, data structure that we work with is distributed block matrix, where A is split into small uh, block matrices, and these block matrices are united in partitions. Then, um, uh, tall and skinny QR uh, decomposition works as follows. We have the, like a dense matrix B, which is uh, very, uh, uh, so it's like uh, N by K, for instance. Uh, and um, basically, we split it into partitions, uh, yeah, by multiple, uh, by combining multiple rows together or multiple block matrices together, and then uh, we apply a uh, so-called uh, uh, implicit uh, QR factorization. So we do uh, QR uh, factorization at each partition, and we obtain the upper triangular matrices, and then we send them, find them, and QR, and at the end of it. The, it, it can be shown that this R that we ended up with at the, at the final layer, it is indeed the uh, upper triangular matrix of the original B. And then we can recover the, uh, uh, the Q, the uh, orthogonalized uh, uh, columns of B, by multiplying by R inverse. And doing R inverse is very simple because it's like K by K matrix. Uh, it's, uh, uh, we, can, we, can, we can almost guarantee that it's uh, going, to, going to be full rank. So it, it's, uh, it's guaranteed to, uh, to work and produce good results. Uh, so the uh, second uh, hard step is how to multiply square sparse uh, matrix by tall and skinny dense matrix. So how we do that? 
so uh, there could be uh, um, multiple approaches, but uh, one that, that fit nicely into Spark and uh, uh, got us really nice uh, uh, constants on the uh, network communication was uh, splitting A into multiple RDDs, uh, resilient, uh, uh, yeah, basically into multiple RDDs by rows. And we do uh, column zipping on every uh, RDD. So in, in such a, uh, in su doing that in such a way, uh, we do uh, we, we send the B, uh, which is dense and uh, um, fairly heavy, only to uh, proportional to the number of RDDs that we split A into, uh, which allows us to do not a lot of uh, uh, network communication. Of course, in some MPI uh, frameworks, we might have done better. Uh, but this approach, uh, it's sort of middle ground. We, uh, we can leverage Spark and it's fairly efficient as well. So we have almost no shuffle, uh, but we have some overhead uh, on splitting uh, A into multiple RDDs. So uh, the properties of our solution is that it can be expressed in MapReduce and Spark API, which means like less engineering, uh, less engineering uh, headache and basically uh, more supported uh, frameworks. Uh, the memory requirements of our solution is independent of size of n, so it only depends on the number of latent factors that you uh, that you need. But of course, the uh, uh, the uh, the the N has influence on how many uh, workers you will require on, or basically how many network communication you will do. So it still depends on it, of course. And we have deterministic results uh, down to machine precision. Uh, so of course it's motivated by uh, a, a huge line of work on approximate matrix decomposition on implicit distri uh, distributed QR uh, that I've described and like uh, putting them together, of course. So we uh, have created this uh, implementation. We uh, open sourced it. Uh, we've tested it on uh, a very large matrices. And uh, basically, if you have similar, um, um, if you have similar problems, that we recommend that you uh, try to use it as well. So, and I'll give you a glimpse into what we do sometimes to remove some of the bias in the data in the data sampling. So we observe user timelines, and um, they can be seen as. Uh, um, from the perspective of random walks. So basically, uh, random walker shopper model, what does it mean? Like uh, basically some uh, notation that uh, vertices in this graph are products and the uh, edge weights are, a, a are likelihoods of a shopper to see another product. Then from this uh, sense, we have the, the walk of the uh, user is guided by some like attractors like our uh, the website. So for instance, like user went to eBay, then probably the next uh, item will be viewed from eBay as well. It's also guided by category, of course, complementarity of products and a lot of stuff that we would like to recover. So basically uh, this can be interpreted from the uh, from this model perspective as graph communities as, uh, that, that are more connected inside them to the other, uh, to the, uh, other communities that are other website or other categories. But not all of them can be useful. Like, uh, for instance, if we, uh, if, there are, if we recover the uh, partner structure of the graph, then it's not very useful for the uh, cross-partner similarity or cross-partner recommendation. So basically, if we map all the products that are in eBay together, uh, this does not help us to make recommendations uh, cross-partner. The same works, works for category, the same works for product uh, complementarity. But the main problems that we had that I described is that uh, we have to recommend products to users that have never been, for example, on eBay, uh, but been on other website. And we need to be able to uh, say which products on eBay are similar to those on other websites. And that's why uh, like uh, same partner recommendations, same partner uh, communities are not super useful to us. So the question is, can we remove the redundant communities without supervision? Uh, and um, basically we have uh, such an approach I won't go into much detail, but it's uh, based into, uh, on, this, um, on some uh, interesting uh, uh, results from the uh, study of uh, sparse blended partition graphs, which is uh, basically a model for graphs with uh, uh, communities. And then there is like, uh, um, there, there is some uh, dependency between how interconnected they are and how detectable they are. So if we can sort of retain most of the information in the matrix, but make this redundant communities like partners uh, in the undetectable, then it means that our uh, extracted singular vectors will not contain this information. And this will allow the flow of like additional uh, structure information there and improve this quality. So uh, 
how we do it is just uh, basically we do down weighting uh, of the weights inside communities. And um, basically, if we uh, look at the simple two community uh, two community case, like two partner case, uh, let A and B be uh, some matrices with edges within communities, and uh, A subscript B, B subscript A, uh, sub subscript A B, sub matrices with edges between communities. So if we downweight them a little bit. Uh, then uh, we can find uh, such a weight that these communities will not be will be indistinguishable, um, and and we can and we can show by using uh, sensitivity analysis that basically uh, the uh, singular values uh, associated with the singular vectors associated with the uh, basically um, partner structure will be depressed by doing that, so will be slow, uh, smaller and we will not recover them. And this uh, uh, we can scale to uh, multiple communities, so we can form a system of linear equations uh, for this uh, downweighting parameters for each community, and we can uh, find a nice set of uh, a nice set of weights. And basically, to give you a little bit of uh, like uh, results, so if we um, like if we do classification tasks on partners and classification tasks at the same time on on embeddings uh, on recovered embeddings on categories. If we do the original one, you can see that we really well can we can really well recover the partners, but the category structure categories I mean like uh, uh, like um, like retail categories cross partner like for instance like shoes cross partner can we recover this information category? It's not very well recoverable, but by depressing the information about partners, we can uh, allow the flow of uh, like second order information about categories in, and uh, basically with by debiasing them. Uh, we can uh, get a much better recovery of the uh, of the categories in the eigenvectors. So uh, this is it. Uh, uh, check out our um, uh, open sourced version of the uh, randomized SVD and uh, ask questions if you have any. Thank you.